Today we're talking about the strange and ongoing subpoena legal fight that's pretty much devolved into Schiff and Trump standing on opposite sides of the reflecting pool while all the national security advisors stand in the middle just trying to figure out which leader to walk to. Come here Bolden, we're going to have your favorite meal tonight if you just testify. Come to my side. The whole court battle started with the subpoena of incredibly famous Trump employee Charles Copperman. Huh, I was hoping it wouldn't be someone I'd heard of, but hey, I can't stage the drama. On October 25th, the New York Times reported that House Democrats had subpoenaed the witness, Charles M. Copperman, who served as Mr. Trump's deputy national security advisor to testify on Monday. But in an effort to stop Mr. Kupperman from doing so, the White House said on Friday that the president had invoked constitutional immunity, leaving Mr. Kupperman uncertain about what to do. Come here, Kupperman. We know you want to testify for Congress. Just come to our side. Instead of making a decision, though, Mr. Kupperman just stood in the middle of that reflecting pool and decided to ask the federal court, filing a suit that said. Plaintiff obviously cannot satisfy the competing demands of both the legislative and executive branches, and he is aware of no controlling judicial authority definitively establishing which branches command should prevail. Now, that might all sound like a guy you've never heard of and who's so insignificant that his subpoena was dropped a few days ago and nobody really noticed. So why are we talking about this today? Well, since he filed that suit, some people you may have heard of have jumped on it like it was the last chopper out of NOM. Lawsuits arguing the exact same points have popped up for Don McGahn, John Bolton, and of course Mick Mulvaney. There are no shortage of plaintiffs though. Mulvaney was one of 13 witnesses scheduled to testify in closed door hearings this past week. Just two showed up. Today I want to go over the legal brief and just kind of figure out what the heck is going on here. Fair warning, all of this is still ongoing. I mean, District Judge Richard Leon said a December 10th hearing in the case and indicated he'd like to rule by late December or early January. Yeah, don't hold your breath on high level testimonies for quite some time. Unless of course Schiff can coax them over to his side of the reflection pool. Unfortunately for everyone who wants clarity, the plaintiff is not aware of any Supreme Court decision definitively answering these questions that came up today. So we're starting from close to scratch on this one. Apparently this situation never came up in the first 243 years of running the country. So let's get started with the main argument. The president's assertion of immunity against congressional process may override the House subpoena. Now this argument is a bit tricky. Trust me, I'm the guy who spent the last few days trying to summarize it in an entertaining way. This argument is built on a foundation of other legal arguments. Specifically, first, the president cannot be subpoenaed, and because of the president not being able to be subpoenaed, well, that immunity should be expanded to his advisors. Not exactly the craziest argument on its own, but Oh man, we're not starting slow in this episode. The problem emerges when you start to look at the disparate pieces of precedent that could be drawn on from both sides in this case. This stuff gets confusing enough that the December ruling deadline might start to make a little more sense. First, the argument that the president can't be subpoenaed. Well, you're going to have to be a little more specific because that's happened a few times. Clinton ended up voluntarily testifying and having his subpoena dropped, although he lied his butt off under oath, so maybe not the best precedent there. Nixon lost his subpoena case and had to turn over tapes he was using executive privilege to protect, although he himself didn't testify. And Thomas Jefferson, well, it was such a long time ago he successfully argued that he left DC to go to Richmond, his absence would leave America without an executive branch, and he succeeded with that argument. Although he wasn't actually the one being investigated, and instead was being asked to testify against his vice president for trying to start an illegal war with Mexico behind America's back. Yeah, it was an odd time. In his absence though, he did turn over a ton of documents and evidence. 
The tricky point emerges from precedent in the Nixon case, which said that executive privilege can be used to protect information related to the official duties of the executive branch. Now, Unfortunately for Nixon, tapes of him talking about everything from covering up the DNC break-in to long and weird talks about how homosexuals were intentionally making clothing more uncomfortable for women because they hate them, yeah, it got really weird. Well, all of that was deemed unrelated to his official acts as president, and therefore couldn't be protected by executive privilege. Now, similarly, the actions Bill Clinton was being subpoenaed for before he reached an agreement were not related to the duties of the president, unless there's a particularly salacious part of the Constitution that I missed. So this case argues that a the president cannot be subpoenaed for this because it's an official act, and more importantly, b by extension of that, Congress may not constitutionally compel the president's senior advisors to testify about their official duties. So to be over the top clear, at this point we're leaving the section about Congress's ability to subpoena the president, and now we're moving on to the precedent about Congress's ability to subpoena the president's aides. Unsurprisingly, this is neither the first time Congress has wanted to speak to a presidential advisor, nor the first time the president hasn't wanted Congress to do just that. Unfortunately for the president in this case, there's one major piece of precedent here, and it supports the idea that advisors have different and more limited protections than the president. Hoo wee, I am getting tired of saying president and precedent in the same sentence. Oh. In the Supreme Court case of Harlow v. Fitzgerald from 1982, it was found that the president is completely immune from civil suits relating to his official duties. Jury is still out on criminal suits, pun intended. But the president's aides are open to qualified immunity, which means that they can be subpoenaed if their official acts clearly violate federal laws or constitutional rights. Now, to restate that into English, if you can prove that a high level government official broke a law or a constitutionally enshrined right, well, you can sue them in civil court. Does anything we talked about so far apply to impeachment though? Well, We don't exactly have a ton of precedent to work with here, especially because impeachment is not a civil or criminal case, but rather a political mechanism. We're really writing the rules as we play the game on this one. Now, There's one other piece of district court precedent from 2008. The House Judiciary Committee has escalated its constitutional clash with the White House by voting to hold two members of President Bush's inner circle in contempt of Congress for defying subpoenas. A district court found that, citing the civil case I just mentioned from the Supreme Court, senior presidential advisors do not have absolute immunity from compelled congressional process in the context of this particular subpoena dispute. Now remember that it's in that context in a bit. There are two weaknesses to citing this result for this impeachment case. First is more about what that case wasn't about than what it was about. Back then, we were trying to figure out why top White House officials fired nine federal prosecutors. We were not trying to investigate the more hush hush duties of the president. The district court in Myers further concluded that the counsel to the president were not entitled to absolute or qualified immunity because the inquiry did not involve the sensitive topics of national security or foreign affairs. Yeah, investigating withheld Ukrainian aid has foreign affairs and national security written all over it. The logic here is, and who boy is it a long shot sometimes, but if there was some sort of big picture playing out in the background, maybe public testimony might not be the best place to find out about certain secret international government projects. Now, if you're having a little trouble getting behind this idea because it's Trump, well, let's talk Obama. This precedent would expand it to all presidents. If someone subpoenaed a national security advisor to testify about why America didn't attack Assad after the ocean seemed to wash away that red line in the sand, well, they might have found out that the president announced the plans to attack the Assad regime and then pulled back. It was the exact same period of time when American negotiators were meeting with Iranian negotiators secretly in Oman to get the nuclear agreement. 
Now, figuring that out would have really trumped that Iran deal before it could have even been seriously considered. The other big problem here is that district court case is very specific and tailor made to that one problem. While the Supreme Court officially figured out on the books, in civil court the president's aides can be challenged and don't have absolute immunity, the case expanding that president to congressional investigations disappeared right next to that line in the sand. It also gave the subpoenaed individuals the right to invoke executive privilege in response to any specific question asked by Congress. Something that, well, you should just tuck that into the back of your mind when we talk about the House of Representatives response. Because of that, subsequent Office of Legal Counsel decisions from both the Obama administration and the Trump administration have respectfully disagreed with the district court's conclusion in Myers, and adhered to this office's long established position that the president's immediate advisors are absolutely immune from compelled congressional testimony. Now that isn't exactly as important as it sounds. It just means that the legal advisors to the executive branch are, you know, respectfully ignoring that this case happened in their arguments to the court. So now to the House of Representatives response to this issue. Well, they largely go back to our top source for all things impeachment president, Richard Nixon. They wrote in a separate but very related brief regarding McGahn ducking testimony, ample Supreme Court and DC Circuit precedent make clear that such generalized confidentiality concerns regarding executive branch communications are properly addressed through a case specific assertion of executive privilege and weighing the competing interests rather than just blanket immunity. The best example of this is to go back to the Nixon tapes. Between his thoughts on R.G. Bunker's perspective on the administration and him out and out confessing to an illegal cover up, up 700 hours of tapes remain to be released on either the basis of national security or family privacy. The House of Representatives is essentially making the assertion, hey, we need those advisors to talk about their official duties working in the Ukraine, but we don't need to hear all of the top secret parts. We have things that we can work with through the Mueller investigation, other testimonies, and the transcript. You can cut off the crust, just give us the sandwich, because there are some unclassified non-national security things we need to figure out. Maybe you could claim executive privilege if we ask you too specific a question. So that's the main thing being argued right now. Whether the Office of Legal Counsel standing on one side of the reflecting pool is right when they call out, hey you're immune from the subpoena because we're talking official acts here, come swim to our side. Or whether Schiff on the other side saying, hey you're definitely not immune to our subpoenas, show up and only answer questions on the unclassified parts of the investigation, swim to our side. We don't know who's right, and as you can tell, we're trying to sew this mangy patchwork of legal precedent into a coherent ruling of a quilt, with broad implications for congressional investigations of the executive branch. Thank you, and well, that's probably not all I have to say about that. Join us on That's All I Have to Say About soon as our legal bender continues, with back to back coverage of the Supreme Court's oral arguments on first, whether DACA is constitutional, and second, the legal remedy for a border patrol officer who shoots and kills a Mexican from across the border, as soon as the Supreme Court releases those oral arguments. Hello YouTube, I'm proud to announce that I just opened up a Patreon account. Special thanks to Eric Webster, Skeeter Zimble, Wayne Cardoza, and Yin Centeno for becoming my first four patrons. If you want to join as well, there's a link in the description. To support independent nonpartisan news, remember to subscribe by clicking on this floating logo to the right of my head. Ring that bell so that freedom will continue to ring, and give me a thumbs up if you like what you saw. Lastly, as always, thank you for watching.